Hello, I'm Dr. Carlos K. Hill, Associate Professor and Chair of the Claire Lupin Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. I, along with Michelle Brown, Program Director of the Greenwood Cultural Center, curated the exhibit From Tragedy to Triumph, Race Massacre Survivor Stories, which is currently on display at OU's Bazell Memorial Library. This exhibit is a centerpiece of the University of Oklahoma's year-long commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. From Tragedy to Triumph tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which is one of the deadliest outbreaks of white terrorist violence against a black community in American history. Aided by police and the local National Guard unit, an armed white mob invaded Greenwood, killing black residents indiscriminately. They looted practically every home and business in the district, then set the structures ablaze. In less than 24 hours, the 35 square blocks that constitute the Greenwood District, more than a dozen churches, five hotels, 31 restaurants, four drug stores, eight doctor's offices, two dozen grocery stores, a public library, and more than a thousand homes lay in ruins. It is estimated that as many as 300 people, mostly black, died during the rampage. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre is not simply a story of death and destruction, it is also a story of courage and resilience. In the days following the massacre, the city of Tulsa passed an ordinance stipulating that a home that had been destroyed by fire could be rebuilt only if it was a two-story structure and only on condition that fire-retarded materials were utilized in the construction. This measure would have made it impossible for most, if not all, black business owners and black residents to rebuild. Fortunately, the local district court issued a permanent injunction against the fire ordinance. Despite the best efforts of the white mob and the city's leaders, black Tulsans rebuilt the Greenwood district brick by brick. By 1942, the district had reached its zenith with more than 242 black owned businesses in operation. In some, From Tragedy to Triumph tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre through a combination of compelling photographs, vivid eyewitness accounts from survivors. In emphasizing the experience of victims and survivors, the exhibit demonstrates the resilience of Tulsa's Greenwood District, highlighting how black residents courageously responded to the destruction of their historic community. The day of the riot, we were running. We were uh, the people. I looked, my mother, when I was awakened by my mother, I was real frightened because she told me what was happening. And, and I couldn't imagine that. I just said to her, I, I just got up and was real afraid. And she says, we have to go out, get out. I said, she says, uh, the white people are killing the colored people. And I just felt that I could see them just lining us up, just going down the line too. We went um, right over the track off Pine was a small chicken coop. And a lot of people went in there because the bullets were just raining down over us. The airplanes was up, just raining down the bullets and I could see them, and I heard them, and I was so frightened, I pulled away from my parents and ran into this chicken coop with all the other people, and I got into the corner of that, just scared as I could be. But my father came in there, and I had to leave out with him so I could be, stay with my family. Well, being a little girl, it was, uh, I was frightened, I was scared. And uh, we had to get out of the way. And there were airplanes flying in the sky that uh, seemed to have been dropping something down to the houses. 
and setting them on fire. And of course, we had to run to try to stay out of their way. And uh, we were trying to get to an area where the Golden Gate Park was and go out there and hide. And we finally made it out there. But what I remember mostly is when all of a sudden my mother was excited is because that she saw four men coming toward our house and all of them had torches, lighted torches on their side coming straight to our house. And when these people came in, these four men came in, they walked right past the bed, right straight to the curtains in the house. And they set fire to the curtains. And as a result, everything in and around was burning. Eventually, they left after then and eventually this fire caused our house to burn down completely to the ground. Well, after the riot, they gave everyone tents, you know, to live in. That's what they were supposed to have to live in. Uh, my father took one and he built a floor you know, got wood and built, made a floor in ours because he said he wouldn't have us on the ground. Well, when bullets fall around, you don't know whether to run, whether to lay down, whether to sit, or uh, what. You you just standing there this way. Uh -huh. And your and dad was real concerned for you. Oh. Well, it, it was pathetic. Yes. You'll never forget that route. That's something to be always in your remembrance. Mm -hmm. uh, the people were killed, and you go in and see the people mangled. Mm -hmm. And then some people you never heard of That's... anymore. You don't know where they, where they were killed, mm -hmm. where they just left town. Hello, I'm Dr. Carlos K. Hill, Associate Professor and Chair of the Claire Lupa Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. I, along with Michelle Brown, Program Director of the Greenwood Cultural Center, curated the exhibit From Tragedy to Triumph, Race Massacre Survivor Stories, which is currently on display at OU's Bazell Memorial Library. This exhibit is a centerpiece of the University of Oklahoma's year-long commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. From Tragedy to Triumph tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which is one of the deadliest outbreaks of white terrorist violence against a black community in American history. Aided by police and the local National Guard unit, an armed white mob invaded Greenwood, killing black residents indiscriminately. They looted practically every home and business in the district, then set the structures ablaze. In less than 24 hours, the 35 square blocks that constitute the Greenwood District, more than a dozen churches, five hotels, 31 restaurants, four drug stores, eight doctor's offices, two dozen grocery stores, a public library, and more than a thousand homes lay in ruins. It is estimated that as many as 300 people, mostly black, died during the rampage. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre is not simply a story of death and destruction, it is also a story of courage and resilience. 
In the days following the massacre, the city of Tulsa passed an ordinance stipulating that a home that had been destroyed by fire could be rebuilt only if it was a two-story structure and only on condition that fire retarded materials were utilized in the construction. This measure would have made it impossible for most, if not all, black business owners and black residents to rebuild. Fortunately, the local district court issued a permanent injunction against the fire ordinance. Despite the best efforts of the white mob and the city's leaders, black Tulsans rebuilt the Greenwood district brick by brick. By 1942, the district had reached its zenith with more than 242 black owned businesses in operation. In Psalm From Tragedy to Triumph tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre through a combination of compelling photographs, vivid eyewitness accounts from survivors. In emphasizing the experience of victims and survivors, the exhibit demonstrates the resilience of Tulsa's Greenwood District, highlighting how black residents courageously responded to the destruction of their historic community. The day of the riot, we were running. We were, uh, the people, I looked, my mother, when I was awakened by my mother, I was real frightened because she told me what was happening and, and I couldn't imagine that. I just said to her, I, I just got up and was real afraid. And she says, we have to go out, get out. I said, she says, uh, the white people are killing the colored people. And I just felt that I could see them just lining us up, just going down the line too. We went um, right over the track off Pine of the small chicken coop. And a lot of people went in there because the bullets were just raining down over us. The airplanes was up, just raining down the bullets. And I could see them, and I heard them, and I was so frightened, I pulled away from my parents and ran into this chicken coop with all the other people. And I got into the corner of that, just scared as I could be. But my father came in there, and I had to leave out with him so I could be, stay with my family. Well, being a little girl, it was, uh, I was frightened, I was scared. And uh, we had to get out of the way. And there were airplanes flying in the sky that uh, seemed to have been dropping something down to the houses and setting them on fire. And of course, we had to run to try to stay out of their way. And uh, we were trying to get to an area where the Golden Gate Park was and go out there and hide. And we finally made it out there. But what I remember mostly is when all of a sudden my mother was excited is because that she saw four men coming toward our house and all of them had torches, lighted torches on their side coming straight to our house. And when these people came in, these four men came in, they walked right past the bed, right straight to the curtains in the house. And they set fire to the curtains 
and as a result, everything in and around was burning. Eventually, they left after then, and eventually, this fire caused our house to burn down completely to the ground. Well, after the ride, they gave everyone tents, you know, to live in. That's what they were supposed to have to live in. Uh, my father took one, and he built a floor, you know, got wood and built, made a floor in ours because he said he wouldn't have us on the ground. Well, when bullets falling around, you don't know whether to run, whether to lay down, whether to sit, or uh, what. You, you're just standing there this way, Father. And your dad was real concerned for it. Oh. Well, it, it was pathetic. Yes. You'll never forget that ride. That's something to be always in your remembrance. Mm -hmm. uh, people were killed, and you go in and see the people mangled. And then some people you never heard of That's... anymore. You don't know where they, where they were killed, mm -hmm. where they just left town. Hello, I'm Dr. Carlos K. Hill, Associate Professor and Chair of the Claire Lupa Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. I, along with Michelle Brown, Program Director of the Greenwood Cultural Center, curated the exhibit From Tragedy to Triumph, Race Massacre Survivor Stories, which is currently on display at OU's Bazell Memorial Library. This exhibit is a centerpiece of the University of Oklahoma's year-long commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. From Tragedy to Triumph tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which is one of the deadliest outbreaks of white terrorist violence against a black community in American history. Aided by police and the local National Guard unit, an armed white mob invaded Greenwood, killing black residents indiscriminately. They looted practically every home and business in the district, then set the structures ablaze. In less than 24 hours, the 35 square blocks that constitute the Greenwood District, more than a dozen churches, five hotels, 31 restaurants, four drug stores, eight doctor's offices, two dozen grocery stores, a public library, and more than a thousand homes lay in ruins. It is estimated that as many as 300 people, mostly black, died during the rampage. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre is not simply a story of death and destruction, it is also a story of courage and resilience. In the days following the massacre, the city of Tulsa passed an ordinance stipulating that a home that had been destroyed by fire could be rebuilt only if it was a two-story structure and only on condition that fire retarded materials were utilized in the construction. This measure would have made it impossible for most, if not all, black business owners and black residents to rebuild. Fortunately, the local district court issued a permanent injunction against the fire ordinance. Despite the best efforts of the white mob and the city's leaders, black Tulsans rebuilt the Greenwood district brick by brick. By 1942, the district had reached its zenith with more than 242 black owned businesses in operation. In some, from tragedy to triumph, tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre through a combination of compelling photographs, vivid eyewitness accounts from survivors. In emphasizing the experience of victims and survivors, the exhibit demonstrates the resilience of Tulsa's Greenwood District, highlighting how black residents courageously responded to the destruction of their historic community. The 
day of the riot, we were running. We were, uh, the people, I looked, my mother, when I was awakened by my mother, I was real frightened because she told me what was happening and, and I couldn't imagine that. I just said to her, I, I just got up and was real afraid and she says, we have to go out, get out. I said, she says, the, the white people are killing the colored people. And I just felt that I could see them just lining us up. Just going down the line too. We went um, right over the track off Pine of the small chicken coop. And a lot of people went in there because the bullets were just raining down over us. The airplanes was up, just raining down the bullets. And I could see them and I heard them. And I was so frightened, I pulled away from my parents and ran into this chicken coop with all the other people. And I got into the corner of that, just scared as I could be. But my father came in there, and I had to leave out with him so I could be, stay with my family. Well, being a little girl, it was... Uh, I was frightened, I was scared, and uh, we had to get out of the way. And there were airplanes flying in the sky that uh, seemed to have been dropping something down to the houses and setting them on fire. And of course, we had to run to try to stay out of their way. And uh, we were trying to get to an area where the Golden Gate Park was and go out there and hide. And we finally made it out there. But what I remember mostly is when all of a sudden my mother was excited is because that she saw four men coming toward our house and all of them had torches, lighted torches on their side coming straight to our house. And when these people came in, these four men came in, they walked right past the bed, right straight to the curtains in the house. And they set fire to the curtains. And as a result, everything in and around was burning. Eventually, they left after then and eventually this fire caused our house to burn down completely to the ground. Well, after the riot, they gave everyone tents, you know, to live in. That's what they were supposed to have to live in. Uh, my father took one, and he built a floor, you know, got wood and built, made a floor in our because he said he wouldn't have us on the ground. Well, when bullets fall around, you don't know whether to run, whether to lay down, whether to sit, or uh, what. You, you're just standing there this way. Uh -huh. And your dad was real concerned for you. Oh. Well, it, it was pathetic. Yes. You'll never forget that, Ralph. That's something to be always in your remembrance. Mm -hmm. uh, People were killed, and you go in and see the people mangled. And then some people you never heard of That's anymore. You don't know where they, where they were killed, where they just left town.
Hello, I'm Dr. Carlos K. Hill, Associate Professor and Chair of the Claire Luper Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. I, along with Michelle Brown, Program Director of the Greenwood Cultural Center, curated the exhibit From Tragedy to Triumph, Race Massacre Survivor Stories, which is currently on display at OU's Bazell Memorial Library. This exhibit is a centerpiece of the University of Oklahoma's year-long commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. From Tragedy to Triumph tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which is one of the deadliest outbreaks of white terrorist violence against a black community in American history. Aided by police and the local National Guard unit, an armed white mob invaded Greenwood, killing black residents indiscriminately. They looted practically every home and business in the district, then set the structures ablaze. In less than 24 hours, the 35 square blocks that constitute the Greenwood District, more than a dozen churches, five hotels, 31 restaurants, four drug stores, eight doctor's offices, two dozen grocery stores, a public library, and more than a thousand homes lay in ruins. It is estimated that as many as 300 people, mostly black, died during the rampage. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre is not simply a story of death and destruction, it is also a story of courage and resilience. In the days following the massacre, the city of Tulsa passed an ordinance stipulating that a home that had been destroyed by fire could be rebuilt only if it was a two-story structure and only on condition that fire retarded materials were utilized in the construction. This measure would have made it impossible for most, if not all, black business owners and black residents to rebuild. Fortunately, the local district court issued a permanent injunction against the fire ordinance. Despite the best efforts of the white mob and the city's leaders, black Tulsans rebuilt the Greenwood district brick by brick. By 1942, the district had reached its zenith with more than 242 black owned businesses in operation. In Psalm From Tragedy to Triumph tells the story of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre through a combination of compelling photographs, vivid eyewitness accounts from survivors. In emphasizing the experience of victims and survivors, the exhibit demonstrates the resilience My brother, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good afternoon. Maybe I should step back a little bit. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the launch event commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. I'm Dr. Carlos Hill. I'm Associate Professor and Chair of the Clara Luper Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And I want to begin this event by thanking the committee that put this event together, the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Coordinating Committee that is co-chaired by Dr. Kalinda Eaton and Dr. Daniel Simon. And I want to especially thank them for their vision, for their leadership, their hard work in bringing this event and many more events to come to fruition. And so if they could just please stand and be acknowledged at this moment, I would greatly appreciate it.
Thank you, Daniel and Kalinda. I also want to give a special thanks to the director of OU Special Events, Stacy Reynolds, and her team. They have been amazing, as well as OU Libraries, who allowed us to host the event here, and especially my dear friend, Senior Director Stacy Robbins, who has been critical to getting the exhibit completed on time, as well as making sure that this event ran smoothly. There are too many sponsors that have made this event possible to name, so I won't mention them all, but I just want to give a shout out to them for making this event possible. And lastly, I want to thank uh, the senior administrative uh, uh, leadership at OU for being present here, as well as dignitaries who are here bearing witness to this event today. Today marks the launch of the University of Oklahoma's commemoration, year-long commemoration, of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which is regarded as one of the deadliest outbreaks of anti-black violence in American history. Not only was the Tulsa Race Massacre a defining moment for Tulsa, it was also a defining moment for the state of Oklahoma, as well as the nation. And so on this historic panel discussion that we're gonna to have today, we have with us the illustrious founder and chair of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, Oklahoma Senator Kevin Matthews. We have with us as well, Commission Project Director Phil Armstrong and Commission Education Chair and local curator for the, uh, for the upcoming Greenwood Rising Historical Museum, Hannibal Johnson. And these individuals, these men, these great men will put into context the significance of the Grace Massacre and why it is important. And the most important thing here today is why it's important to remember what occurred nearly 100 years ago. And so before we begin that discussion, I want to ask OU President Joe Haruz Jr. to provide some brief opening remarks. But before he gets here, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about President Haruz. President Haruz has served at the University of Oklahoma for nearly 25 years in a variety of roles, including Vice President of Executive Affairs, General Counsel, and Dean of the College of Law. In May 2020, the OU Board of Regents unanimously appointed him the 15th president of the University of Oklahoma. Please join me in welcoming President Joseph Haruz, Jr. Thank you. Thank you all heard Dr. Hill and the emphasis he put on the word briefly. Felt like that was very pointed. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's great to be with a number of friends in three dimensions. Um, it's been a two-dimensional world now for a while and for those that are joining uh, via Zoom or otherwise, it's great uh, to be here. This is an event that I've been thinking about for a while. And, and I, I think about it with frequency. Senator and I were just speaking. Whenever I came into this role, I said that if we don't get diversity, equity, and inclusion right, nothing else matters. And so as we're here on a week to celebrate, think, reflect, and hopefully act, and to assess, for us to truly move forward, talk a lot about being bold and about being honest and about being clear-eyed. Well, Carlos has quickly become a friend and while he's too young to be this, he's also a, a, a hero of mine. And there's another hero of mine here right now, Dr. George Henderson. And we sit absolutely. And I'm so proud when I, when I look at what's being done, when I heard 
initially about what Dr. Carlos Hill, Dr. Kalinda Eaton, uh, and Daniel Simon were doing on behalf of OU to be a part of this centennial. To work with the three of you all in commemorating this, it is, it is much more than a commemoration. It's a lesson. It's a lesson in history that we have to understand, and if we're going to move forward, we have to be able to understand our past. We talk a lot about the university can either be a microcosm and we can reflect society or we can be better and we can show the way. And over the past couple of years, we've done a lot of reflecting at OU in both senses. Simply reflecting society and not being better than society, and that receives criticism and it should. And it's also caused us to reflect, to think about what our role is and about what we're supposed to do as a university, as the state's flagship public research university. What is our role and where does that fit? But you gotta be honest. And yes, we have to celebrate our heroes. When we think about this university, I'll list a few. Ada Loisipiel Fisher, right? First African American to apply and after a Supreme Court battle, US Supreme Court battle with the assistance of Thurgood Marshall, finally make it in. Think about George McLaurin, OU's first black student. Dr. Melvin Tolson Jr., first full-time black professor. Dr. George Henderson, my hero, first African-American dean on Norman campus. Regent Sylvia Lewis, Regent Melvin Hall, Dean Stan Evans, who's a friend and colleague and mentor of mine, first African-American dean at the law school. These are all really good firsts. But we have to also be really honest about our history. We've got to look at who we are before we can be what we want to be. We've got to look at Norman. We hear the stories from Dr. Henderson, a living history of the fact that Norman, like many towns in Oklahoma, was a sundowner town, which is a nice way of saying what it really is and has been. And so it's important that we think about our history if we're really going to move forward. I grew up in Oklahoma. I took Oklahoma history and I never learned about the race massacre. And how can you really know where you are and where you can go if you don't know where you've been? If you don't know where you've been, you simply can't. And so to me, what's so important is for us to understand and reflect on what happened 100 years ago not just to memorialize and remember those that were the victims, but for us to think about where we are today and how we get to tomorrow, and if we get to tomorrow. And so as we go through this, and you will hear from the three experts in much greater detail, and I'm honored to have Hannibal's book. It's on my desk. It's signed, so I feel pretty cool about that. But when you go through it in very terse summary, Right, the Greenwood District, then known as Black Wall Street, goes through 12 hours of destruction. In 12 hours, the toll is staggering. And I'll just cover it just very simply, right? 12 hours, a white mob goes in, and more than a dozen churches, a dozen places of worship are destroyed. Five hotels, 31 restaurants, four drugstores, eight physicians' offices two dozen grocery stores, a public library, more than a thousand homes, and more than 300 are dead, almost all black. 12 hours, that's all it took. And any effort to erase this from history does a disservice to them and a disservice to us and those that follow us. And so when we talk about where we are today, and we've all lived it, and the current example and message of that is embodied in a number of individuals, currently and most prominently George Floyd. And what we see happening is a microcosm of hundreds of years of history that has to be addressed, that you have to be honest about it because there is no tomorrow that is better than today unless we're honest about the past. That is how it must be. And so as we're here today, as we think about where we are, you know, one of the quotes from Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. that I've always loved is this is the statement that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice. 
when I first heard that and I first thought about it, it seemed terrific to me. It seemed like it was fraught with optimism. And there is optimism in it, but I also think it's fraught with caution. Because how long is that ark? And does it necessarily been to justice? And how far is it when it's toward to being to justice? And so for us to be who we want to be, whenever I say we must get this right or nothing else matters, it's because there is an indelible honesty that attaches to this. Because if we can't be true and honest about where we stand as it relates to racism and the impact it has had and that it has today, then we cannot be who we want to be. We cannot make tomorrow what it needs to be. And so as we look at the university, what can we do? The idea is we can't simply reflect society. We have to identify systemic problems. And we have to find remedies and solutions to those that make a lasting change. And we are heading down a path that is promising. We are not there. There is more work to be done. But we have a written plan that contains objective measures about how we make fundamental change. And we're making that move, but we have to be vigilant. And at all times, it requires context. All of the actions. Our strategic plan has five pillars. This is one of the five pillars. But those can be just words, and those cannot have life breathe fully into them unless we truly understand our history and our present because our history speaks to our present. And so I'm honored to be here. I look forward to listening to this panel discussion. I had the honor of being with the three individuals that are on our panel discussion in the Greenwood District and see firsthand the work that they're doing. And what I love about it is, is that when you're there, you have the written word, but you also feel and can see and identify when you walk down Greenwood and you get a sense of what was there and what happened and what shouldn't have been and what could be, all of those things. And so it's an honor to be here. This is an important day. We have more celebrations about what the future can be by recognizing the devastation that took place during this massacre. And this is the first of several events we're going to have on campus, and I hope that in each of these, more learn the story, more, even more feel the story, and that we move forward in a way that makes tomorrow and delivers on that promise of that arc bending towards justice. Thank you. Thank you, President Ruse, for those remarks. At this time, I would like to invite to the podium my dear sister, OU Pre Vice President for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and OU Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Belinda Higgs Hypolite, to help us frame the importance of OU's commemoration of the race massacre and square that with the work that we're doing on this campus around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Before Dr. Hypolite comes to the stage, I just want to tell you a little bit about who she is. On January 6th, and I remember the day because I remember seeing her that day, I believe, Dr. Belinda Higgs Hippolyte joined the OU executive team in the Diver Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion as the Vice President for Diversity, Inclusion, and Chief Diversity Officer. In her 24-year-long career in higher education, she has served in a variety of roles and leadership responsibilities. Throughout her career, Dr. Hypolite has passionately advocated for the voiceless through her work in diversity education and oppression reduction. As a social justice advocate and educator, she believes that access to education is a right, not a privilege. Persevering in her journey to promote the success of diverse faculty, staff, and students, Dr. Hypolite is proud to serve as the new Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion and OU's Chief Diversity Officer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Belinda Higgs Hypolite. Good afternoon. Hmm. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. 
I know that we're all masked, but we can still engage each other in a very unusual time. Um, thank you, Dr. Hill, and thank you to everyone for um, being here today. Thank you to our esteemed panelists. I'm certainly looking forward um, to continuing learning and to hearing um, about um, the work that you've been doing, and I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of this celebration. So today I've been asked to give remarks on the importance of this event. And before I go into my remarks, I just want us to reflect back on the last 24 hours of what's happened in these United States of America. I'm not sure if anybody has been watching the media cycle, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, but there was a, a decision that was handed down in Louisville, Kentucky, where my oldest sister lives, um, where a black woman by the name of Breonna Taylor was killed while lying in her bed. And the significance of that um, event is that the day that the decision was made that no formal charges would come to an innocent victim was also the 55th anniversary of Emmett Till's murder. And for me as a black woman, serving a university um, that I've grown to love and treasure, only having been here for a short time, it is so important that we honor our history, that we take time to remember it, um, and that we never forget that we are still in a fight and in a struggle for justice in this country. And we use words in our founding documents like united we stand and one nation under God, but there are still marginalized populations that are a part of our community that do not feel that this is a place that is safe for them to reside and show up as their authentic selves. And so having got that off my chest, because sometimes I think that it is important to acknowledge where we are in a space. The Tulsa Race Massacre, it's so important that we remember this. There are lots of names that have been assigned to this event. As I was doing a little bit of studying to be prepared to bring remarks today, the names that popped up when I did my search were Tulsa Race Massacre, Tulsa Race Riots, Greenwood Massacre, Black Wall Street Massacre, Tulsa Massacre. Massacre is said four times. Race is listed two times. These events took place, as our president just highlighted, over a matter of 12 hours. It was a white mob of residents that were deputized and given weapons by city officials to legally go in and attack black residents, businesses in the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma. This event has been categorized as the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. Not just in the state of Oklahoma, which is where it took place, but in America's history. Many survived the Tulsa massacre but they never talked about the events of that night. And so it's almost like as if it didn't happen. And so when I was asked to talk about the importance of this event, I think it's important that we remember. History teaches us a lot of lessons, and if we don't remember history, then we're bound to repeat it. So in the early 1900s, racial tension and racial injustice was rampant in the United States and within the state of Oklahoma. And here we sit in 2020, and our nation is still grappling with issues of racial tension, injustice, discrimination. Some have reported protesters as rioters, and we continue to be a part of many divided communities. But here at the University of Oklahoma, we must acknowledge the pain of the past and of the present day. It would be easy to say that it happened back then, but there is pain that individuals are still experiencing today. We also know that it will take each of us working collectively to ensure that we are together, intentionally supporting each other. It is important to remember the past to ensure that we never forget. 
that we have more important work to do. And in the words of Frederick Douglass, he once said that without struggle, there can be no progress. So even while we continue to struggle through with the pains of the past and present day, we need to position every community for success while we work purposefully to live up to the promise that we have made to faculty, to staff, to students, to community partners and stakeholders who are associated with the University of Oklahoma. The Tulsa Race Massacre reminds us of where we have been and it also reminds us that we must strive and we must do better and we must create a better future. So Thurgood Marshall was mentioned by our president as well. We did not talk about what we would discuss today. Um, but he said something that I want to leave us with. He says, I wish that I could say that racism and prejudice were only a distant memory. We must, we must descend from the indifference. We must descend from the apathy. We must descend from the fear, the hatred, and the mistrust. We must descend because America can do better and because America has no choice but to do better. So thank you for being here at this event. We must remember. Thank you, Dr. Hypolite, for those insightful remarks and putting this event into context as it relates to OU as well as the country uh, and, the, and the events that are unfolding as we speak. It is my special pleasure to introduce the three gentlemen who are on the stage right now. And I have the, the privilege of having work with them for, for many years, I would say at this point, and spend at least an hour with them in a weekly meeting each week to discuss the business of the commission. Uh, so it's a special honor, because I don't know if I'll get a chance to do this again soon, to talk about the three individuals who are on the stage who in many ways are heroes of mine and, and, and created a space for me to bear witness to what happened in Tulsa 100 years ago. And so I wanna start with Kevin Matthews. I wanna introduce him and then introduce Hannibal as well as Phil Armstrong. Senator Matthews, Senator Kevin L. Matthews is the current founder and chair of the 1921 Race Massacre Centennial Commission. He served 25 years on the Tulsa Fire Department, where he retired in 2010 as the Administrative Fire Chief. Senator Matthews was elected to public service as state representative in 2012 and was elected as state senator in April 2015. And part of the district that he represents uh, is the Greenwood District. Prior to becoming an elected official, he was accepted into and graduated from the Center for Advanced Leadership and the Andrew Young School of Policy Council in Atlanta, Georgia. While a state representative, Senator Matthews was accepted and attended the Darden School of Business Emerging Leaders Program at the University of Virginia in July 2013. In December 2013, Matthews was one of only 20 legislators chosen to attend a White House briefing in the West Wing with President Obama. Senator Matthews is past chair of the Oklahoma Legislative Black Caucus, the current uh, chair of the Oklahoma Senate Democratic Caucus. Matthews is a 2015 graduate of Leadership Oklahoma and a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. Senator Matthews. <laughs> Next is Phil Armstrong. Phil Armstrong is a native of Ohio and has been in Tulsa 
for 20 plus years. He holds a bachelor's in mass, mass communications from Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio, and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Akron. Phil has a varied background working in the corporate sector and as an entrepreneur in the business, in the re restaurant business. In 2019, he was hired by the commission, um, excuse me, he was hired by the commission as project director and has been actively engaged uh, in serving in a variety of nonprofit boards, which includes Community Service Council, Reading Partners of Tulsa, and the Greenwood Cultural Center. There's much more to say about Phil, and he will share this with you later, but at this moment, let's just welcome him, Phil Armstrong. Last and certainly not least is Hannibal Johnson, whom I've learned a tremendous amount from about the Greenwood District, its history, and I think who's written probably the most, most recently about the Greenwood District and with his new book that the president mentioned earlier. Hannibal Johnson is a Harvard Law School graduate He's also an attorney, or author, excuse me, an attorney and consultant specializing in diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, human relations, leadership, and nonprofit leadership and management. He is taught at the University of Tulsa College of Law, Oklahoma State University, we won't hold that against you, and the University of Oklahoma. Johnson serves on the Federal 400 Years of African American History Commission, a body charged with planning, developing, and implementing activities appropriate to the 400th anniversary of the arrival in 1619 of Africans in the English colonies at Port Comfort, Virginia. He chairs the Education Committee of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, of which I am a committee member. His books including, include Black Wall Street 100, An American City Grapples with Its Historical tra Racial Trauma, which chronicles the African-American experience in Oklahoma and its in an indelible impact on American history. Johnson's play, Big Mama Speaks, a Tulsa race riot survivor story, was selected for the 2011 National Black Theater Festival and has been staged in Coe, Switzerland. He has received numerous honors and awards for his work and community service. Hannibal Johnson. Thank you, Hannibal. And so today we're gonna to have a discussion about the race massacre, its significance, and why 100 years later we should be bearing witness to it. And so I wanna invite uh, to the lectern my co-moderator, Tyra Jones, if she would come up, Tyra. And as she's coming up, I want to tell you a little bit about Tyra. And so Tyra earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Human Relations from the University of Oklahoma in 2020. She is currently a first-year master's student in Human Relations at OU. Among Tyra's many, many activities, she is president of the Black Graduate Student Association. She's president of the Student Society of Human Relations, as well as a graduate assistant for Goddard Health Services. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Tyra Jones. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So before we begin with our questions, I want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Um, although we are gathered today to commemorate the events of the Tulsa Race Massacre, we are also present on the campus. So I'd like to quickly acknowledge that we are visitors on this land and that during our time together and beyond, we will work to honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples and forced migrants connected to this territory and the land on which we gather. All our learning and dialogue must acknowledge the land on which we sit and occupy as a traditional home of the Caddo and Wichita affiliate tribes of Oklahoma. We also recognize that unpaid and forced labor of black and brown people built the, built the institution in which we learn. 
Without these communities and ancestors, we would not have access to this gathering and to this dialogue. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. First question for Senator Matthews. In 2015, you founded the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. What is the Centennial Commission's mission and vision and what has been accomplished thus far? And I can repeat the question if you need to. Can you repeat the question? Yes. In 2015, you founded the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. What is the Centennial Commission's mission and vision and what has been accomplished thus far? Okay. The mission, the stated mission, uh, for those that are listening that want to follow our work, may go to our website, www.tulsa2021.org, where it states that our mission is as follows. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial, and I will tell you that Hannibal wrote this. I'm excited about everything that we have documented. Hannibal has had a hand in it, so I want to I extend my appreciation to him for that. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission will leverage the rich history surrounding the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre by facilitating actions, activities, and events that commemorate and educate all citizens. And we have several things that are around our vision, but we ultimately want to become an example of reconciliation around the world. The work that Hannibal and Phil are doing, we want that to cause when you come to Tulsa and you go to Greenwood Rising and you come to the area, we want dialogue to take place. And we believe that as your president said, if you don't acknowledge the past and address it, and the best way we see addressing it is through dialogue and reconciliation. And so that's our long range vision is to be an example of reconciliation for the world. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Um, I want to turn to to Phil to talk about sort of the activities, the day-to-day -day activities, planned activities, future activities and initiatives of the commission. If you could talk to us about some of the signature initiatives, events that you have planned as we move closer to the 100th anniversary and if you could share with us just a little bit about perhaps how people can get involved. Thank you, Dr. Hill. I'll start off with a quote from uh, James Baldwin that says, uh, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. That's been the overarching theme, that quote by James Baldwin, and it actually be featured on the 11,000 square foot facility that the Centennial Commission is building with the uh, assistance of the entire community of Tulsa and state of Oklahoma called Greenwood Rising, the Black Wall Street History Center. It's gonna be built at the corner of Greenwood and Archer, which historically was the gateway to what was considered Black Wall Street. That's gonna be our feature bricks and mortar project uh, that will be completed in the spring um, by May, by the centennial of 2021. Uh, it will be a narrative museum to tell the full experience and the full history and the full story. The community was very, very adamant in the many community meetings that we have held that um, we should not just continually focus on the massacre. That they want people to hear the full narrative history of Greenwood. They want people to find out and know and learn about how black people got to Oklahoma in the first place. Tell people about the all black home, all black towns of Oklahoma. At one time, there were over 50. Talk about 1883 when Oklahoma was actually being discussed among legislative leaders that Oklahoma could possibly be the first black state. Um, long before the land run of 1889 and long before 1907, 
black citizens were prospering, what led to the creation of a Greenwood and that entrepreneurial enclave called Greenwood. Then get to the massacre and then, more importantly, educate people so that they don't think that time stood still at 1921. Show them the resiliency, the human spirit in the people of Greenwood that they rebuilt this community. That within five years, 80 to 90% of Greenwood was rebuilt, all without insurance money and all without the help of the city or state government. Um, and tell the full story. Uh, so Greenwood Rising is gonna tell that story and it's being designed by museum experts um, out of New York City called Local Projects, Principal Jake Founder. Uh, their work uh, with the 9-11 Museum and also the Legacy Museum and work with Brian Stevenson and Montgomery. And so they uh, have been phenomenal to work with to make this vision turn into reality. Some of the other major projects is the building of a pathway to hope, which will be a construction project that will actually begin this fall and it will lead citizens on a narrative historical uh, walking path from Greenwood Avenue to Elgin Avenue, and it will be seen as a symbol of rejoining the district that was separated and in somewhat destroyed by the building of the I-244 highway program, the 60s and 70s urban renewal programs, what many African Americans refer to as urban removal, and that took place in Tulsa. That was one of the death nails to what was Greenwood. And so this pathway to hope gives you this walking path to reflect and take you over to the John Hope Franklin Park. And I uh, don't think it's um, out of place to say that just two weeks ago, the John Hope Franklin Park was designated as the latest addition by the Park Service for the uh, National Civil Rights Network, National Civil Rights Trail. And so we are working together collaboratively, collaboratively with all the organizations in Greenwood. We have a Summer Teachers Institute, which Dr. Carlos Hill heads up. This is our third year um, that public school teachers can come and learn this history, learn the pedagogy, and learn how to teach this information and become certified to go back to their schools and teach other teachers on this history and this information. Uh, we have cultural tourism as another aspect of what will happen. In fact, the chair of our cultural tourism uh, committee is here with us in the audience, Mr. Brandon Oldham, who's a member of the commission. We have an arts and culture committee, um, and that is overseeing the Greenwood Art Project, which uh, the city of Tulsa won a million dollar grant from the Bloomberg Philanthropies to, uh, for that project. And then we have economic development initiatives. The last thing we want is for people to think that May of 2021 will be a time where we just come together and sing Kumbaya and we've applauded and we've sung and then go back to our respective quarters. Uh, Senator Matthews and the Centennial Commission has been very adamant that next year is just a launching pad. It's just a, the beginning of a three, five, 10, 15, 20 year trajectory of economic development and when things began to change for race relations, racial healing, healing from racial trauma as they people come to see Greenwood rising. Thank you, Phil. Question for Hannibal Johnson. The highly anticipated Greenwood Rising Museum is scheduled to open in October of 2021. As the local curator, what will be the museum's mission and goals? So the History Center called Greenwood Rising, and of course Greenwood Rising is an aspirational title, the rising part. Um, the idea is to tell the full story of Greenwood's rich history, to tell in a, in a way that is cohesive and holistic, uh, that does not focus on the tragic events that happened in the community, but rather focuses on the human spirit, the individuals who built the community, who had that, that vision, the individuals who sustained the community over time, who persevered against great odds and were resilient and rebuilt their community after its devastation. So Greenwood Rising will have four essential galleries. The first is the Greenwood Spirit, then Systems of Anti-Blackness, followed by Changing Fortunes and the Road to Reconciliation. So in the first gallery, Greenwood Spirit will learn about the founders of the community, will learn about connections to the freedmen, people of African ancestry, who were members of the five civilized tribes, 
who acquired land and pooled their land to create economic wealth. We will have um, holograms in a barber shop that will be a unique museum experience that is not replicated anywhere else in the world in that gallery. In the second gallery, which is systems of anti-blackness, we'll talk about social, economic, and political systems that still exist, systems that persist over time, that uh, disengage and disenfranchise people of African ancestry. And that is the gallery in which we will focus also on the massacre, but it will be contextualized. We'll talk about the national context. Uh, historians and sociologists refer to the early part of the 20th century as the nadir of race relations in America, the low point of race relations. And that's, that's the environment in which the massacre occurs. So that, there'll, there'll be that space. Changing fortunes will be the space in which we talk about the remarkable rebuilding after the massacre, the changing fortunes that occur as a result of urban renewal and integration, which causes a decline in the economic fortunes of the community. We'll talk about the remarkable report that was issued by what's, what was called the Oklahoma Commission to Study the Tulsa Race Right of 1921. That report was issued in 2001. Uh, that will be a transition point into the final gallery, which is the road to reconciliation. What we want our patrons to do is to immerse themselves in this history, learn the lessons of that history, and then leverage those lessons to be able to confront the challenges that we face around race today that are playing out in the streets of communities all across the country, even as we speak. So those four essential galleries um, the Greenwood Spirit, Systems of Anti-Blackness, Changing Fortunes, and The Road to Reconciliation. Thank you, Hannibal. And I'm going to ask the, the next question, and I would love it if the three of you could maybe take turns uh, answering it. And this is a, a question that um, I have reflected on deeply about over the last three or four years since I've been in Oklahoma. But I want our audience to understand from the men who have sort of really brought this history to the forefront for not just Tulsa, but for the nation. Why is it so important to refer to what happened as a massacre versus a race riot? And after you've kind of talked about that, if you could just shed a little bit of light on why is it also so important to talk about this event as a kind of triumph over tragedy. So if you could maybe touch on those two, and, and Hannibal, you can start it since you've just been recently speaking, but I, want, I would love it if all yeah. of you could, could touch upon it. So, so I'll start because I think I, I disagree with the premise of the question. So okay. for, 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 me, <laughs> for, for me, um, massacre is an appropriate alternative, but it's not the only one. Okay. And that's where I disagree. So f for me, What's really important around nomenclature, around these labels that we attach to these events, is our critical thinking. How did we get to the point of labeling this thing anyway? So if we do that, then we ask, who named this event? Who was absent from the table when the discussion was being had? What significance is the label that we attach? In the case of race riot, it had particular significance because insurance policies would not pay claims that were occasioned by riots or civil unrest. Let's ask ourselves, once we know the history, what alternative names or labels might be appropriate? And if we have a name that is the 1921 Tulsa race riot, what might be an alternative? Now, we've, we've already talked that massacre might be an alternative, but what about pogrom, which is a mostly European term of application? What about Holocaust? Most of the destruction occurred by way of fire. What about ethnic cleansing? What about genocide? What about white riot? What about assault? All these things are things that have some applicability to what happened in Tulsa in 1921. So I guess wh where I am defensive and resistant is there have been some people who insist that you cannot call this a race riot. That's problematic because that is a term of art that was used at the time. It's in all the historical documents. And most of the survivors were interviewed, and they're on record, they're dead now, but they're on record as referring to the event as a race riot. So we have to kind of understand 
how they came to call it that and why, and then appreciate the alternatives. And have, let's have this robust discussion about what should we call it. I'd like to, to say first, uh, to put this in context, Hannibal and I have had this discussion since 2015. And so uh, it's important to understand his point of view, which is accurate. It's also important to understand how it came to be named Massacre after all of this discussion. And, and let's just remember that I'm the founder of this, and I am a current state elected official. And I represent those people that are voting today. Those people are the black people in Tulsa that had strong resentment to the name riot because it was so harmful to uh, those ancestors of those that did not get their insurance claims paid, that were so disrespected because of the name riot. And they felt that our people, if you described it as a massacre, you would understand they were slaughtered and killed. And so as we discuss that, and I represent those people, and one of the things that we didn't talk about was in 2017 when I was the only black man in the Oklahoma State Senate, we were able to pass Senate Bill 17 where every person in the State Senate and the State House voted unanimously for us to fund the Race Riot Commission. Now the resentment of the current people was why do you call it riot when we were killed and massacred? And so they wanted the name change to reflect how they felt, and I represent them. And so because of my constituency, and this did go through the state legislature, and I yielded to those people I represent to name it Massacre. And that's how it became Massacre, rather than to continue to have discussions about other alternatives. Uh, Hannibal and I did agree that this was one alternative, and for an elected official, what your constituents want was the best alternative for me. If you want to stay in office, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just I want to say one more thing. Why is it important to understand this in the context of our history? It's important to know when we talk about who's not at the table and who's not talked about. Here, we had the Oklahoma City bombing where 168 lives were lost. We have a national federal monument to those lives lost. 99 years later, we've discussed possibly twice as many black lives lost in the most horrific event of uh, domestic terrorism in the United States and we can't even find a tombstone. What is the difference? Is it because there were black lives that were lost? Think about that one. I'll be uh, very quick and I'll just say in response to this, this question, Dr. Hill, I, pretty much the best response is once again the quote with James Baldwin, the tail end of that, nothing can be changed until it is faced. Um, the primary, one of the primary focuses of the Centennial Commission is educating, is teaching and educating. And um, not surprising, this topic really causes some consternation. Some people look at it as, you're, why are you changing history? Why are you trying to label it wasn't what it wasn't? And what I appreciate so much you know, from Senator Matthews and from uh, Hannibal Johnson and the others is the foresight to, again, listen to the community, even with everything we're doing. That's why from 2015 to here, it's a lot of community meetings. It's a lot of kumbaya, it's a lot of listening, it's a lot of going back and correcting. And when they responded to that, it was um, gratifying to the community that they were being heard. And even in our logo, I love, actually I really love our logo in that it actually says Tulsa Race Riot. It has the word there, riot, it's crossed out, and then the word massacre is underneath. It invokes 
a conversation. Just by why is it crossed out and why was it left there? It invokes conversation and allows discussion to take place to educate. This was the important reason why we did that. So it, it, it educates. That, that, that's powerful. And I've heard you, uh, each of you talk about this, but uh, none more powerful than, than you have just now. Um, Tyra, do you want to you want to follow up on anything or? OK, um, I want to open it up for questions. If there are any questions in the audience, just raise your hand and we have some students who will come around and provide a microphone so that everyone in the room can hear if you have any questions for the panelists or me or Tyra. <laughs> Oh, that's going on, Dr. Hill. I'd okay. like to say that okay. um, none of this work would have been as effective as it is today while we, we have uh, Dr. Hypolite that is talking about diversity and inclusion. Hannibal and I have worked in this area. I did that for the fire department. I feel has worked in various areas. But what we realize is that these things cannot change if black people don't have non-black people join us in this fight. Some of the great work that we've been able to do is myself, a black senator with uh, U.S. Senator Lankford, who is white, been able to speak on the U.S. Senate floor, been able to appoint Hannibal to the 400 Years Commission, been able to help us to meet with the state superintendent to now make this be part of the curriculum for the first time this fall statewide. Those things would not happen if we did not have bold and courageous people like Dr. Harus having us do this today. And those people outside of our race that join us in this fight. Absolutely. I want to ask just one more time if there are any questions. And I'm sorry, I need to turn my body. <laughs> Hello, first of all, thank you. This has been very educational and I'm excited to be a part of the conversation. But building on your last statement, what can cities around Oklahoma do to help commemorate this occasion? Because it, it is for all of us. It's for everyone in the state, everyone in our nation. And, and I'd like to be a part of that. So I, I would love some suggestions again on how cities around the state can participate. If I could be self-serving, <laughs> I, I will advertise my book and say a community read would be a good thing to do. Have discussions around the book as you read it. Um, think about what, what in the book is, is relevant to present day uh, racial issues and then engage. Um, the, the point for me is that we all have individual agency. We have the capacity to do something, even if it's only incremental. And that starts with a grounding in history. It starts with eliminating ignorance um, and understanding what our history is and then applying those lessons to the present. I want to say that along with that, when you read uh, Hannibal's books that are extensive and, and very accurate, if you have an opportunity to see the work that Dr. Hill has been doing with our Teachers Institute, uh, which people outside of our state participated in, one of the, the most uh, elementary things that happened is we had a middle school group come to Greenwood and go and tour and discuss the difference in riot versus massacre. Learn about that and have groups that have dialogue around what happened and what could happen and why those things happened. Because as we said earlier, if we don't understand our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And the way not to repeat it is to understand it and talk through why this happened in 1921. And then why do we have people of authority today that still kill black people and are not held accountable. And I would say, when we're in an institute of higher learning, it is your job to go out into the world and be the judges, the district attorneys, the police chiefs, and those people that make decisions, 
that are courageous enough to make people accountable when these types of things happen? Thank you for the question. And, and since my, my, my boss, Senator Matthews, is on this stage and he has uh, made me the project director to, to raise this $30 million uh, for our projects, we're at 24, about $23.8 million. My initial knee jerk response to that would be write a check. That's the first thing you can do is write a check and go back to communities and tell them to write checks. Uh, that would be number one. Uh, but seriously, number two would be. Um, to do the most simplest of all things, and that is, uh, as Senator Matthews and as U.S. Senator Langford continue to talk about, is go and have conversations with people who do not look like you. When's the last time you invited people to your home for dinner? COVID in the world, it's, you know, it's a different situation, but get on a Zoom call and have conversations, have a safe space to see life through someone else's eyes and the power, as simplistic as it may be, uh, and I'll use the words that you, you, Senator Langford says all the time. He says, white people like me need to learn this story, need to learn from it, and see how we can be reconciled and move forward together into the future. And so that is probably the easiest thing. And then third would be make plans to be in Tulsa next year uh, to commemorate with us this history. People will be here literally all over the world. We'll be tuning in and even visiting Tulsa for the centennial. Um, and please go to our website, tulsa2021.org. We have a community calendar there. We have a commemorative grants program that people can apply for. Um, there's a calendar to know things that are going on all throughout the year and especially as we get close to be a part of that. And when we get to the point of opening the museum, we're gonna need many volunteers that will come over, learn the history, volunteer to become a docent and say, hey, I wanna help people take them through the, the museum and learn this history and be a part of that. So those are the various ways. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, along the lines of the practicality of moving the arc of history toward justice a little faster. Um, has there been any uh, attempt to uh, join up or join forces with other cities across the nation? I was born in East St. Louis, Illinois. And as I'm sure you know, there was a similar but smaller scale massacre that occurred in that town and the city of St. Louis, Missouri also had urban removal. I did not know a word of this history until I read a book called The Broken Heart of America. And so in addition to the education piece, is there a possibility of extending your work to other cities that could have a similar history to say work through a commission of mayors? The previous questioner is the mayor of Norman. So work through a commissioner of mayors to form these commissions such as yours and join together in a larger, more extensive attempt to bring history into our lives today as we move forward. Yes, there have been um, various um, gatherings of communities with similar uh, historical racial trauma. I, I went to several meetings years ago um, convened with participants from cities like Duluth, Minnesota, where there's an infamous lynching, and we gather, commiserate, talk about strategy, and so forth. Um, there is a great effort in, in Richmond, Virginia. I went through a, a fellowship program called Connecting Communities in Richmond about maybe 15 years ago. Richmond has done a great job facing its, its history and addressing it on a, on a regular basis, holding conferences, um, a, the focus is really on trust building in communities. But yeah, there, there, are, there are a number of efforts afoot that bring together uh, these communities and address how we might deal with historical racial trauma. Any other questions on this side? Any other questions? Any other questions? 
in the audience. There's a, a few questions um, that we received uh, from the live stream, and I just want to share those with you. Uh, the first question is, and, and Phil, I think you might be able to respond to this as well as Hannibal's. Uh, when will the History Center open? Can you give us a definitive date when they can walk into that building? And then second, um, will there be a documentary developed? And I've been thinking about this question um, since I received it, which is, I think, a great question because it's, is, is anyone capturing the work that the commission has been doing over, since 2015? Uh, is there a documentary to tell the story from the vantage point of the survivors? Is there anything that the commission is doing to kind of document, tell this story? To so those two questions. I'm keeping records and plan this next year to release um, information on how this happened from the beginning to the end. So I will, not a, a, a documentary, but I will have a document uh, or a small piece of literature that gives my, my uh, rendition of what happened from 2015 to 2021. Uh, to answer the, the, the first portion of that, um, yes, the anticipation of the opening of Greenwood Rising. So um, during the week of the centennial, we're planning many events, but one of those events during the week, uh, the centennial will take place, of course, is May 31st, 2021, is the day of the 100th anniversary. But during the week, we want to have a dedication of the building. So the building will be our goal, and we're working vigorously with local projects and the construction company, um, that the building will be there, and we're already, the last two weeks, we've actually had discussions to see if the uh, first portions of the interior museum can be open, um, and I should say history center. Um, but the exhibits, because of the nature of the exhibits and the nature of this, this, this material and this history, um, the full narrative museum, uh, more than likely, we're looking at a fall 2021 date when the 100% opening to the public. But a dedication of the ceiling itself uh, and the building uh, being there and present will take place that, that, that week. Secondly, on, on the other ask of the, of the question, there are various, obviously, a lot of attention. There are a lot of attempts for documentaries being made. Uh, I think uh, everyone knows that LeBron James and his production company made announcement two months ago. They actually have a film crew in Tulsa this week, uh, and they'll be there different times during the week. Um, also, Russell uh, Westbrook uh, is going to develop a documentary. Um, the good thing is that they are acknowledging that the Centennial Commission is someone that they want to sit down with, get information from, collaborate with on, on these projects. As far as a project that's going to maybe kind of be behind the scenes, Senator Matthews and myself and one of our co-founders of the fundraising committee, Glenda Love Williams, met with a group uh, called Trailblazer Studios. And they also, with their documentary, want to specifically focus in on not only the history, not only Greenwood Rising, but they want theirs to be more so of a behind the scenes, the work of the commission and, and the things that we had to do and work through in meetings. So um, there, that's being discussed and worked on as well to answer that question. And I was like, no books, no more books. No more books. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to just pause and make sure that uh, there are no more questions uh, in the audience or any, not even questions, reflections on what, what you've heard before we close out. Anyone? In back. We are surrounded by books, so I can't resist mentioning something about books and reading. First of all, thank you. Uh, thank you, OU community, for hosting this event. And uh, uh, one of the suggestions I have uh, of the panelists, as well as everybody else, to ask athletes uh, to talk about books, reading, history, Things, of, uh, things like that to encourage the younger people to read more. We talked about P 
people talked about growing up in Oklahoma and not knowing this thing had happened. Uh, I grew up in Iran, came here, had problems with the immigration office, services and my immigration status. I started reading, reading about American history, reading what makes this country tick. I've been translating the Federalist Papers into Farsi. I'm on my second round, and this country has a lot to offer, and uh, I think one of the places that we need to ask to encourage people to read is uh, get people who are on TV, on the screen, uh, have young people's attentions, and that's athletes right there. And I think uh, when you go home and start strategizing, and think about uh, bringing this up with athletes all around the U.S. and tell them to bring up the subject of reading and uh, uh, learning about this country so that then they can encourage others to read more and so that we can learn more about this country and make it better. I think that's one of the things that's really, really missing. They advertise Coca-Cola, 7-Up, that's all just fine. But uh, I think if we encourage them to talk about books, uh, they will do it. So thank you very much. Well, just thank you. But uh, we did not mention that the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, has contributed a quarter million dollars to this. And they have decided to come to Greenwood specifically for African-American children to start to learn at a higher level to learn not to play basketball, but the analytics and those things that uh, would make them uh, be able to work behind the scenes in the sports arena to make a great living. So they are looking at the educational and training aspect, and they have committed uh, to us just in the last couple of months to do that. Thank you. Um, we've run over just slightly, so I want to try to gracefully bring us to an end by thanking our distinguished panelists, Phil Armstrong, Hannibal Johnson, Oklahoma Senator Kevin Matthews, for their insights and perspectives. Thank you. Thank you for being here today and helping the OU community understand the significance of the race massacre. I also, again, want to thank my co-chairs uh, of the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Coordinating Committee here at OU, Dr. Kalinda Eaton and Daniel, Dr. Daniel Simon for all their hard work, leadership, vision, uh, for helping to bring this event to fruition as well as events that we're gonna be planning in this year-long commemoration. I also wanna follow up on what uh, all three of our panelists have said, please visit Tulsa21.org. This is a site, a website that you can learn about the activities and initiatives of the Centennial Commission. Uh, this is a commission that's open to the public. The commission wants feedback. There are various committees that you can be a part of if you're interested in participating in the commission. So please check out that website if you want to get involved. And lastly, I would say, OU has created a Remembering the Tulsa Race Massacre website that has a catalog of events as well as activities that will be happening not just here at the University of Oklahoma, but also OU Tulsa and the Health Sciences campuses, campus. So there's a lot that can be done if people want to get involved, they want to learn more. Please lean into this issue in 2020 and 2021. And so with that, I will close out. I want to thank everybody for being here. This has been an amazing event, and I want everyone to come to the reception and have a good evening. So thank you, guys.